Good morning. I am introducing this morning author R.J. Lee, who was born right here in Natchez as Robert Joseph Kenley. He went to school here in Natchez and received a B.A. in English and Creative Writing from Swanee, the University of the South. Following in his father's footsteps, who wrote detective and fighter pilot pulp fiction after World War II, Lee took his work to New York City. His first series coming out in 2006 for Putnam was entitled, his debut novel was entitled Waltzing at the Piggly Wiggly. Don't you love that? It's about six wealthy widows up in the Delta who are trying to save their local grocery store from going under by ballroom dancing in the aisles. You know, his mother did teach ballroom dancing. When that four novel series ended, Lee signed with Kensington Books, for whom he has now written 15 novels, nine novels, excuse me, has 15 altogether, nine novels. His latest series, A Bridge to Death Mystery, features this amateur female sleuth in the Mississippi River port of Rosalie, a tweaked version of Natchez. Starting with his third novel, Cold Reading Murder, Lee features uh, Natchez places, real places, including Darby's and their fudge, Silver Street Gifts, Smoots, Fat Mamas, The Bridge of Size, that former rock group Bishop Gunn, and those forthcoming new docks that are coming in, Viking and American Cruise Lines. The fourth novel in the series, Bridge to Death, the title, The King Falls, will be released February 2022. I give you R.J. Lee. Thank you, Judy. I appreciate that. And uh, the story of my writing career begins with my father, who uh, wrote Pulp Fiction, as you said, in New York after, after World War II. And I was particularly intrigued by the fact that he wrote detective stories. Uh, several years later, I got the Agatha Christie bug. And those of us who read Agatha Christie know that um, you can't put them down. After you read one, you, you want to read them all. And the thing I liked about Christie's writing was she single-handedly invented what is now known as the cozy mystery novel. And the cozy is in a class by itself. In that sort of mystery, you do not have graphic sexuality, you do not have a lot of blood and gore and violence, and you don't have profanity. As you all know, Christie was an English woman, and her, her writing and her culture reflected the civility of that culture. Um, everything took place in quiet little villages, and her style uh, was very appealing to me. Uh, it was sort of like, I will have a murder, then I will have a cup of tea and a scone on the side. And so it made it seem acceptable, even though we were talking about murder. So I liked that model. And after I had finished my, sec my first series with Kensington, I went to my editor and I said, John, I really would like to follow in my father's footsteps and try my hand at cozy mysteries. Now, he wrote hard-boiled detective stories that we have come to know as the Sam Spade um, variety with the hard-boiled detective and the, the mysterious woman who hires him, that sort of thing. But I really wanted to go the Agatha Christie route. And for those of you who don't know, the cozy mystery genre has exploded in the last decade or so. There are very many different series by many authors. And one of the things that you pretty much now are required to do when you write cozy mysteries is have an overarching theme. They have to be connected in some way. You can have the same main characters, uh, different murders, victims, suspects. But there has to be some theme. Uh, probably the most successful um, cozy mystery writer right now is Joanne Fluke. Her mysteries are all about uh, pastries. And she wrote Murder She Baked and Chocolate Chip Murder and all of that sort of thing. Well, 
I decided that that had been covered. So I was not going to have my overarching thing be about cooking. But my parents taught me bridge at the game of 15, uh, at the age of 15. And I was a very impressionable teenager and I got hooked on bridge. Now, I, I can tell you that people who like bridge are one of a kind. They like the socialization of the game. They like the challenge. It is a cerebral game. There are no two hands that are ever alike. And I really fell for it. Uh, and when I got to college at Sewanee, I wanted to continue my bridge playing. And in the dorm, I found three guys that liked bridge as much as I did. And what I'm going to tell you now is an example of the truth being stranger than fiction. All three of these guys were named Steve, I kid you not. One was from Missouri, one from South Dakota, and one from Texas. The odds against my finding three guys in the dorm who like bridge, all named Steve, is something I could never use in fiction. My agent and my editor would say, that's stretching credulity. People wouldn't believe that. Throw somebody else's name in there. So. Uh, that's a little side sidebar that I wanted to throw in there. But anyway, I decided that the game of bridge was going to be my overarching theme for this new mystery series. My editor said, that sounds fine. I have never played bridge. I've always wanted to learn. Are you going to teach me how to play in the series? And I said, I'm not going to teach you how to play, but I will offer some uh, pointers for those who want to uh, learn how to play or freshen their game or whatever. So John said, present a two book proposal with bridge as your overarching theme. I'll look it over and let you know, yay or nay. So uh, one of the things that I realized I had never done was address my hometown of Natchez in my fiction. Not really. As, um, as Judy said, my first series for uh, Putnam was set in the Mississippi Delta. Of course, those characters came out of my being a Southern gentleman, so to speak, growing up in the Deep South and observing a lot of Southern women. But it was still set in the Mississippi Delta. The first series I did for Kensington was set in the Northeast corner of Mississippi in a fictional town that I called um, uh, Cherico. And that was about a librarian who fights City Hall to keep her, her job in the library above, above water. Um, but that was a, a total invention, total fictional invention of mine. It had no relationship really to Natchez. I really wanted to make Natchez the focal point of this mystery series. Um, I've said before in, in many talks I've given that Natchez is a writer's laboratory. Uh, it's full of layers, as we all know. It's full of eccentric people, uh, well-known families, uh, all different uh, kinds of people live in Natchez, have for over 300 years. The immigration pattern is rich. Uh, we have not only Native American culture, which was wiped out, by the French in 1716 or 1720, something like that. But we have the African Americans who were brought over as slaves. Ignore that phone call. Um, we have the Spanish who at one time uh, owned Natchez and drew out the grid pattern for the town. Uh, the British. And then later, after the Civil War, um, we had immigration patterns coming up from New Orleans. A lot of Irish and Italian people came to live in Natchez and still do. So I wanted to reflect that diversity. The um, nickname that some people call Natchez is the little easy because it's like New Orleans in a way, but much, much smaller. Uh, it has a go cup district, bars that stay open all night. Um, and celebrates Mardi Gras. We have pilgrimage parties. We have lots of festivals here. 
So John said, great, are you going to call it Natchez? And I said, no, I'm really not going to call it Natchez. I said, you know, um, uh, Greg Isles has covered the base with Natchez. I would like to have a little freedom, a little, a little uh, more wiggle room, so I'm going to call it Rosalie. As many of you know, the original name of, of Natchez was Fort Rosalie. It was founded in 1716. And that came from the fact that uh, Rosalie was the Duchess of Pontchartrain at that time, and it was meant to honor her. So also, Rosalie is a mansion on the Natchez Bluff, uh, now owned and uh, operated by the DAR quite, quite efficiently. And so I thought Rosalie would be a great name. Uh, and in the first two novels in the series, uh, we have first here uh, Grand Slam Murders. That was the debut novel in 2019. Then the follow-up novel was Playing the Devil in 2020, which I call my, my COVID baby because my uh, book tour was totally disrupted by COVID as all of our lives were disrupted. And my, uh, my book tour became virtual just as this is virtual, but thank goodness for technology. Um, which brings us to uh, Cold Reading Murder, which was released on February 23rd. So this little baby is four days old officially. And this is the novel that brings more of Natchez into Rosalie. And what do I mean by that? I mean that this is the first time I have put actual names of businesses, uh, characters, instead of place names, that those wiggle room place names. This is the first time I've actually used uh, firms like Darby's. I have my main characters eating Darby's fudge. Uh, uh, I have the Bridge of Size figuring prominently into this particular novel. Uh, my amateur sleuth, Wendy, figures out the solution in Cold Reading Murder by standing on the Bridge of Size and getting a little perspective. And by the way, I love the Bridge of Size. It, it as, as you know, was originally there. It was a wooden bridge in the 19th century and has now been recreated quite dramatically across Roth Hill Road and presents, I think, one of the best views of the Mississippi, if not the best view of the Mississippi River up and down. And I also see the rock group Bishop Gunn uh, in this novel. At the time I was writing it, Bishop Gunn was up and running and they were opening for name acts across the country I had this wild idea that Bishop Gunn was going to work into my uh, in-person uh, book signing event in Natchez uh, this year. Uh, they broke up, but they're still in the plot. I have them actually as the band that plays at Wendy's wedding. So I thought that was fun to, in to include them. Uh, and even if they never get back together, they will always be co commemorated in literature by me. And um, I mentioned Smoots, Fat Mamas, and their famous tamales, and knock you naked margaritas. Uh, in the next book, The King Falls, I mentioned uh, Silver Street Gifts. And so it was, it was my pleasure to actually put a lot of Natchez, more of Natchez into this third novel in the series. To get to the plot, which connects us even more to the subject of bringing more of Natchez uh, into Rosalie, I have the plot opening with my amateur sleuth, Wendy, teaching bridge lesson, lessons to five newbies. They really want to learn the game. They don't know anything about it. And uh, they convince Wendy to teach them bridge from scratch. These five people are a very diverse group, and one of them has come to Natchez to practice being a psychic reader or a mentalist, uh, however you want to call it. To that end, she rents a mansion on the High Bluff. Now, in my view, the High Bluff is Clifton Avenue, which actually exists in Natchez. People know Clifton Avenue quite well. 
and it is a very, very dramatic neighborhood, perched 300 feet above the river with some very interesting homes, many of which are bed and breakfast at this point. In the novel, my psychic character, Aurelia Spangler, uh, sets up the house because it has a reputation of being haunted. It turns out the backstory is that the builder fell downstairs and broke his neck during his house inspection and never got to live in it. And ever since then, the house has been cursed. Everyone who's tried to own it and do anything with it has met with not necessarily foul play, but what you could certainly call bad luck. And when Wendy arranges with Aurelia to give these bridge lessons at the house, it's a very interesting beginning to a very peculiar mystery that Kirkus Reviews said is quite original uh, and, and very difficult to determine who the well-hidden killer is. That's music to my ears because mystery writers love to engage and then fool their readers. They love to hear, oh, I never saw that coming or why did I think of that? So uh, that is music to my ears. Back to the plot of Cold Reading Murder. I have a lot of other interesting characters that Wendy teaches Bridge to in addition to the psychic. Um, I have a recent graduate of LSU who is a theater arts major. And of course he wants to go to Broadway, but he has to settle for delivering singing telegrams in Rosalie for a company that calls itself Party Palooza. And they are the party uh, crown prince and princess of, of, of Rosalie. And uh, that particular character, I think, is one of the best I've ever invented. And he actually has a lot of myself in it. I lived in New Orleans for 30 years. And during that period, one summer, I was in between jobs and I got a job, believe it or not, delivering singing telegrams throughout New Orleans for this New York company. I was dressed in a tuxedo and a top hat and I had a pitch pipe and I went all over the Crescent City singing these corny telegrams that people paid for. Um, uh, interesting little, little sidebar here. I, I don't mind telling stories on myself. Uh, I think probably one of the most interesting telegrams I ever delivered was to a Tulane professor and her husband, and they lived uptown on State Street. I delivered the telegram to them and they were just delighted and they decided to uh, offer me uh, several libations of tequila straight up. And so uh, I decided, you know, to have one and then two and then three, and then it became time for me to leave and I couldn't move. <laughs> there I was on their sofa and I said, you know what? Is this sofa spoken for? Because I think I'm going to have to spend the night here. I don't think I can get up. So we became good friends after that. But from that entire summer, I thought, you know, I ought to have a character in one of my mysteries based on someone that delivers singing telegrams. So this young man is one of the five bridge newbies. Uh, and I have to tell another little bar here about his, his name. Characters' names are very important. Um, before COVID, when I was traveling all over the place for my book tour, uh, I had a, a signing in Pensacola, Florida, and I uh, had one in Perry, Florida, too. So I traveled from Pensacola to Perry one year. And on the way, there's an interstate exit. And the interstate exit points the way to two little towns in Santa Rosa County, Florida. One is Milton, the other is Baghdad. So here's this interstate marker that says Milton, Baghdad. You know you're a writer when you, when, when you say that is the name for a character. So Milton Baghdad is the name of my singing telegram deliverer and would be bridge player. One of the five that um, Wendy has to, to uh, instruct. 
And the others are a recently widowed middle-aged woman who has just moved to Rosalie to start her life over, and a great American novelist writer, or at least that's what he says he wants to be. He's come to Rosalie because he's heard it's very Southern, and he wants to learn as much as he can about Southern culture and interview people in Rosalie so he can write this deep South American novel. So he's one, and, and he feels that if he learns bridge, he may be able to gain entree to a certain level of society uh, that might be interesting for him, for his character development. So uh, he's one of the, uh, of the bridge newbies. And then the last is a college student. I have invented the College of Rosalie. Now it doesn't exist, although this particular literary festival is run by uh, the Natchez campus of Kapai Lincoln Community College. So you might say maybe maybe the College of Rosalie is <laughs> is Colin, but um, at any rate, uh, she is she is a college student and she's uh, she wants to get away from her mother who is oppressive in every single way. She lives with her mother and she wants to learn bridge and she wants to break out and she wants to learn how to drink, which by the way is really easy to learn how to do in Rosalie, which is Natchez. And so cutting to the chase here, um, that first bridge lesson taking place in the overview mansion that uh, Aurelia Spangler has mentioned, and I call it overview because it has a grand overview of the Mississippi River. And they have their first lesson, which opens the plot. And Wendy teaches them things like the point count and what you have, how many points you have to have for an opening bid. And if you don't know anything about bridge, I guarantee you that you will learn the basics of the game. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't take that long in this chapter for her to cover these, uh, these opening instructions. And Aurelia has told Wendy that she thinks it would be a very interesting thing for her as a psychic to give all five newbies a free cold reading after their first bridge lesson. Now she's doing this, obviously, as a sales technique. She wants to make sure that these people pass the word that she is a very accurate and interesting uh, psychic because she's about to put out her, her shingle. And so what then happens is one by one, Aurelia gives free cold readings, which are predictions uh, out of thin air supposedly, but most mentalists have tricks that they use. And every single one of these readings is right on right on target. And one, the one she gives to Milton Baghdad is so disturbing to him that he actually leaves town. He, he just wants to leave. It's so distressing to him. So it seems like she's either the real thing or she's got a really nice scam going. We don't know which. In any case, to whet your appetite for this particular mystery, two days later, Wendy goes to visit Aurelia in at Overview and finds her dead. Finds her dead in her little prediction room with a suicide note saying, I can't go on living this way and cocaine all over the place. So it appears she has taken a, co a cocaine overdose and committed suicide. Wendy's not buying it. She doesn't think that that's even possible. Aurelia was very uh, sanguine about setting up shot in Rosalie, uh, being an old, old city with lots of old tales and lots of people who probably are interested in contacting ancestors. That's a big thing in old Southern cities, ancestry and genes. So um, here, poor Wendy is again. If you haven't read the first two novels, Grand Slam Murders and Playing the Devil, you know that every time Wendy sets about either to learn bridge or play bridge, somebody gets killed. So it's kind of like murder she wrote in a way because eventually people say, uh, don't take bridge from Wendy or don't play bridge with Wendy because you might be the next one to go. 
So um, anyway, may, yes, of course it's stretching credulity to think that um, all these murders take place with a bridge connection, but hey, this is fiction. And it's my universe and I can do it all. And also the series is doing well and people seem to like them and they wanna know what further mischief Wendy is getting into. Anyway, uh, after Aurelia is discovered dead, um, the coroner definitely uh, says that a cocaine overdose was the cause of her death. And Wendy's still not buying it. Now, those of you who have not read my novels don't know that Wendy has a great deal of help in her amateur sleuthing career from two men. One is, in the first two books, he's her boyfriend. In the third book, she's actually married to him, her husband, Ross Rearson. He is a detective on the Rosalie police force. And her father, Bax Winchester, is the chief of police. So both of these men uh, always have their own formal investigations of these murders. But Wendy, being the daughter of one and the wife of the other, is able to get information she probably shouldn't have using her feminine wiles. Um, I did some research about this, and I interviewed the chief of police uh, of the University of Mississippi here at Ole Miss. And she, she, she was very cooperative with me. I said, let me ask you this. At the end of the day, does the spouse of a police officer sometimes get information they shouldn't have because their spouse is just overloaded. They need to have someone to unload on. And she said, you bet. It's not supposed to be done. You know, the, the formal investigations are supposed to be private, not to be shared with the public. But the husband or wife of a police officer can often get little tidbits that he or she shouldn't have. So Wendy is always able to get extra information. She herself is what I call a puzzle savant. Um, she has a little window of knowledge in her brain that enables her to solve things that often have the police stumped. She does it in the first two novels and she does it in this one too. And it's not anything out of the ordinary. Uh, well, it is out of the ordinary and that most people don't have it, but I mean, it's, it's, it's credible. The things that she tumbles to are, are totally believable because she puts two and two together, which is what I always like so much about um, Agatha Christie's uh, heroes and heroines. Uh, Miss Marple and Hercule Poirot would link things together that nobody else would link. And I really like that formula. Uh, I like having the, the, uh, the gifted person who is not afraid to go out on a limb, sometimes make mistakes. Wendy sometimes is a little too reckless in her investigations, not considering her own safety. But in cold reading murder, she eventually uncovers something that has much more to do with fortune telling. It turns out to be something that's quite insidious um, and involves not only Rosalie, but New Orleans, and it's it's quite widespread. So um, since conspiracy theories seem to be so popular these days, and <laughs> I'm not taking sides on that, uh, let's just say that uh, she stumbles upon something that, that really is quite evil. And in cold reading murder, the tone is set by the whole idea that some people can see the future. And Throughout this entire novel, you will be wondering if Aurelia Spangler was the real thing, a scam artist, or a little bit of both. And the bottom line is that one of the free cold readings that she gave cut too close to the bone for someone, and it cost her her life. Well, that's about as much as a spoiler as I want to do, but I want to assure you that this is very, very Natchez, and people who live in Natchez or people who have visited or want to visit will be intrigued by the authenticity of the characters and the level of social interaction that you will encounter in this series. So having brought more of Natchez into Rosalie in this third book, I do it even more in the fourth. 
I just finished writing the fourth novel, The King Falls. And that'll be out now in April of 2022, I've been told by my editor. I'm taking a deep breath, as I know we all are, hoping that we have conquered COVID by then and we can get back to in-person events, theater, church services, everything that we're used to that we have been denied. And that's pretty much my hope is uh, I'm, I'm to get my second uh, shot on March 8th. So I highly recommend it if you're able to get it. And when your time comes, take advantage of it because we all want to be safe and healthy and get back to some semblance of normalcy. Having said that, there's nothing normal about this particular series that I'm writing. Uh, when you're discovering that you have a terrible task at hand, you've got to get rid of somebody and then you've got to set up all these red herrings. You've got to make them believable too. You have to keep on uh, writing all the angles so that people get confused and they have trouble figuring it out. And so, as I said, my greatest pleasure when I hear from my readers in form of emails or messages or even in-person uh, conversations is that, how did you come up with it? How, how did you think that, that up? I, I can't answer that except that uh, I know that my father had the bug to write when he was growing up and did so. And I guess I inherited it from him. So uh, whether you live in Natchez or not, whether you want more Natchez brought into this series or not, I think you will enjoy the range of characters, uh, the, the, the different viewpoints that they all bring. Uh, I like the idea of, bring, of bringing diversity into my plots as well, because we're all on different journeys and that's a, that's, that's a good thing. And when we interconnect for the right reasons, I think we accomplish quite a lot. So um, I'm just wondering if it's time to open the floor for any questions that we might have received from people or what's the deal out there. Um, I think I've come pretty much to the end of my explanation of bringing more of Natchez into Rosalie. Uh, what do you say out there? I say, I can't wait to get out of here and go buy a stack of books. That's what I say. <laughs> my goodness, this cold reading murder sounds fabulous. But my question is, do you think we should start at the beginning of that series? And the first one in there was Grand Slam Murders. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Can we start That's at the beginning or can we jump in anywhere? Let me say this. I am very aware of the pros and cons of writing a series. The pros are that you establish a universe, people like your characters, they know who they are, they become familiar with them and they keep reading because they wanna know more. Now the con is that some people think, well, I don't wanna miss stuff. I don't wanna get on the third book and not know what happened before. I'm very careful in the first uh, three books to make sure, uh, certainly not in the first book stands on its own, they can all be standalones. I give you enough information briefly in the beginning to let you know who the main characters are. And the, the main characters in, that will appear in every one are Wendy, her father Bax, her husband, boyfriend Ross, and a, uh, a maid cook housekeeper named Merlise, who has become a favorite of many people. I had not intended to include Merlise after the first debut novel, but John in New York said, you have to keep Merlise in. She's just, she's just wonderful. Now, and also this is where we're, uh, we're bringing to an end uh, Black History Month. Well, she is a woman of color and I think she is a street smart, wise person. And she is one of my favorite characters too. She uses the vernacular in that she will say things like, I heard that and current, current phrases that are, are very popular. Um, but that's who she is and I introduce other people of color in my series who do different things. So uh, uh, let me say that they can be standalones, but if you want the smoothest ride, I would say you could start with Grand Slam Murders, proceed to Playing the Devil and then pick this one up. But you could read Cold, Cold Reading Murder and understand it completely. Oh, and one other thing, if you don't play bridge, 
You do not have to worry. You don't have to understand and play the game to either understand the plot or even solve the crime. Sounds great. We have several questions for you. Uh, is this book and Milton Baghdad the first time you've written a lot of yourself into a character? I, yes. Now, let me say this. I put some qualities of, of myself into Wendy. She's had red hair just like I did growing up. Uh, she has some freckles. Um, she likes higher math, which I didn't. So <laughs> she's not completely me. But yes, Milton Baghdad is the first character that I based on a segment of my life that I have never forgotten delivering singing telegrams in a big city like New Orleans at all hours was an experience that made me think, you know, somewhere along the line, I want to work this into a novel. And darn if I haven't done that. Yes. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Next question. Uh, how many books do you think this series will have? Let me say this, um, my agent has advised me to do outlines for books five and six. Uh, COVID has had a, an effect on all book sales this past year, as you can imagine, for all authors. People have just not gone out, browsed, and done their usual book shopping. But uh, she's advised me to go ahead, uh, try for book five and six. She will then sit down with my uh, editor and negotiate. What I would hope is that it would become iconic enough and popular enough, or we get a, a, a multimedia type of awareness that it'll go on. I love these characters. I would like to write mysteries forever. I think this is what I was, am best at writing, be honest with you. Um, and I have some interest here and there from various media outlets. Um, there have been copies sent to Film Natchez uh, I have an actor-producer friend in Australia who is reading it now and passing it along to production companies down there. So just fingers crossed, uh, huh, I wish I, well, I can't tell you whether Aurelia Spangler is a real thing or not, but I wish I were a psychic and I could tell you how many there will be. It is my intention to write as many as I can. Sounds wonderful. Let me thank you for writing Cozy Mysteries. I had never heard it called that, but mm -hmm. so many of them, to tell you the truth, I don't want to read. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question. You bring in real Natchez locations. Do you bring in any, in any real Natchez characters as we are full of those in Natchez? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I haven't gone that far yet. Now, those... I'm still kind of, let's say, making Oreo's nest of, of people. A little twig here of this person. I'm blending people. Um, be, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm ready to actually po point the finger and say, now, this is John Smith, and there is a real John Smith, and I'm going to make him do all these things. Mm -hmm. The pl places of business, I made sure I had their approval, and I, they're happy. I mean, Obviously, Darby's is happy, um, particularly since I mentioned the fudge, although that doesn't need selling from what I understand. And Silver Street Gifts, I, uh, I made sure it was okay with Gail Guido. Um, I have done several book uh, fundraisers for the Armstrong Library with, with, with several books. Uh, I, that gives me the opportunity to say that um, because of the winter weather last weekend, the shipments of the books from New York uh, are, I don't know where they are right now. They're, they're on the way, two Natchez, but um, they will be here soon. If you want to support the library uh, and get a signed copy uh, from the Armstrong Library, whatever sales they have, I will match with contra contribution to library funding. And then if you want to buy your book from Silver Street Gifts or Darby's, all their sales, I will match with contribution to the stew pot. Oh, excellent. I'm a big supporter of food banks. I contribute quite a bit to the food pantry here in Oxford. These have been tough times for people. People have been thrown out of work. Uh, people are hungry. Uh, this is a terrible time. And I, uh, I haven't forgotten that I'm fortunate, but there's some other people out there that are not. Mm. 
Sounds wonderful. I was wondering where I could get my book. I can't wait. All right, next question. What is your writing routine and how do you motivate yourself to write? Hmm. Let me answer the second part of that first. The motivation comes from the fact that you have a contract. <laughs> You're given an advance up front, which is free money. You never have to pay a penny of that back. It's given to you on the understanding that the, the publisher thinks you have enough talent to produce work that will sell. If, if you don't sell a copy, they have to write that off. They have to eat it. The other thing is after you get your advances, which, which, which I get in thirds, I get a signing advance. Uh, when I deliver the manuscript, I get an, uh, an advance. And when the book is released, I get the last of it. Once you sell through your original uh, advance, let's just say for sake of argument, it's $20,000. Every copy after that goes to your royalties. So your motivation is that if you don't do these things, that's the only instance in which that money can be taken back. If you don't produce the novels that you signed to produce, then they will take the money back from you. So that's your biggest incentive. But then I also have a creative incentive. I feel that I owe it to myself and I owe it to my readers to produce good work and to live up to the contract that I signed. Mm -hmm. As for my routine, it is definitely probably different from other people. I don't have a definite time of the day that I write. I, and I write in spurts, which is not to say that, and I'm not disciplined. It means that I'll write maybe five pages and then suddenly I'll stop. The next day I'll go back, I'll review it. If I like it, I'll leave as is. If I don't, I'll edit, then I'll move on. I can do five pages at a time, 10, two, I'm not predictable in, in, in the amount of quantity. I'd like to say I'm predictable in the amount of quality. I hold myself to a high standard when it comes to editing. So in that, that's probably my best routine is self-editing, going back and revisiting. Well, let's see. It was in the mid-90s, I guess, that you came out to Colin at the old campus on Highway 61 North. Uh -huh. And that's when I first met you. Uh -huh. uh, you had written a book, God of the Doors. Is that correct? God of the Door, single door. Of door. Yeah. I read it, uh, loved it. And I'm going to be perfectly honest. Uh, I used to have red hair too. Um, I can't <laughs> remember quite as much as I could years ago, but I remember something out of that book, and that means something if I remember something from that many years ago. You describe mm -hmm. the Caribbean as the color of comet uh, uh, cleanser. Cleanser, yes. And it was such a vivid image. I have never forgotten it. Well, uh, but anyway, we just thank you so much for this talk today. You have just gotten me so excited. And we're going to turn this back over to Emily now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. I appreciate it. I didn't realize we were all a bunch of redheads sitting here. So <laughs> that's fun. Yours is still the, red. The vegan <laughs> redheads. We're very special people, a, a genetic minority on the face of the planet. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, well, this, this was great. RJ, I thank you so much. Um, I know you've already went over with people how they can uh, purchase your book and the different places that those are supporting do you have any final comments you'd like to make before we wrap up? Yeah, I had to, you broke up a little bit, okay. but I got the last part. Any final comments? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, be patient if the three outlets that I mentioned don't have the books in today. I've been checking with them daily. There were some things I didn't get uh, because of last week's terrible weather. Um, but they will have them at those three locations. All you have to do at this point is just get in touch with them, reserve a copy. And uh, I also hope if you haven't read the first two, uh, that you'll look into, in, into getting copies of those and realize that you live in a very special town. You already knew that. And a lot of people have written about it. It has inspired a lot of people. It's just not your ordinary play, place to grow up and live in. And uh, uh, I guess I continue to pay tribute to it with my writing.
Well, I will say I'm going to go back and read the first two because, you know, I read Cold Reading Murder and mm-hmm. you you definitely caught me off guard, which I've already told you. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh-huh. So um, you didn't see the solution coming, right? Nope. I didn't see okay. a couple of things coming and I and it was cozy it, and it was enjoyable. It was a nice escape from everything right now. I really, really enjoyed it. So. Thanks. Thanks yeah. so much. Emily. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank right. you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, mm-hmm. Judy, thank you for uh, helping us this this morning. And Most we do enjoyable. <laughs> good. Um, we do ask everybody to remember there are surveys floating around to let us know how we're doing. I'll post a link in the comments and um, you can find it on our website. We do have one more presentation to wrap up the week and that will be at one o'clock this afternoon with Richard Grant and I hope to see everybody back here and again thank you so much thank you bye bye